Um, I am actually not going to introduce the panel. Um, and what I thought we would do actually to start out is just kind of go around and introduce ourselves and talk about kind of why we're here and the work that we do. Um, my name is Cooper Levy Baker. I'm a reporter with Sarasota Magazine. Um, covered a lot of stuff over the last 10 years. Um, as Jennifer pointed out, I've done some environmental stuff, covered a lot of food stuff, public policy, uh, civic issues, and things like that. Um, but I'm really here just to ask questions, and I want to make this as informative as possible. So. Um, uh, would love to, towards the end of it, you know, as you're jotting down questions that you have, um, want to get those involved as well. Um, so I'll just start uh, left, Jim Beaver. Uh, you want to take a, just a minute, introduce yourself, and kind of tell sure. us what you're about. I don't know if this mic is on. Does it seem to be? Okay, good. I'm glad I didn't say anything rude while we were getting set up here. <laughs> Hot mic. Um, I'm Jim Beaver. I'm with the Southwest Florida Regional Planning Council. I am the principal climate change planner in your region. I've been working on this for decades and did the regional vulnerability assessment, which covers all of this county. Got 17 different projects I've worked on in climate change, ranging from salt marshes to mangroves to evaluation of ecosystem services. And um, just to let you know, other types of work I did, I was very involved with that Babcock Ranch project you saw. And I want you to understand that idea didn't just come out of the developer's mind, it was part of a multi-year community planning process involving a development of regional impact and all of those things came together because the community supported a project like this and Sid Kitson who's the gentleman who's behind all of that saw that there was a need for people who wanted to live that way to have a place to be and so basically um, I'm continuing to do climate change planning one of the most recent ones here in Sarasota County was actually done by the community of Pelican Cove and it's the first climate change adaptation plan funded by citizens, no government involved, to do a climate change adaptation plan for their own community on Little Sarasota Bay. Great, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Kevin Morris with the Peace River Regional Water Supply. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the water supply? Sure, is, is this on? Yeah. Um, as Cooper said, I'm Kevin Morris. I've been with the Peace River Minnesota Regional Water Supply Authority for 20 years. I'm an environmental engineer by training. Um, I'm the manager of engineering and projects for the authority. Uh, and what is the Water Supply Authority? We are, we are a drinking water agency only. Uh, we're comprised of four counties, Charlotte County, Sarasota County, DeSoto County, and Manatee County. And we provide about two thirds of Sarasota County's drinking water, Northport's drinking water, and about 95% of um, uh, Charlotte County and DeSoto County's drinking water. So if you're, um, if you're drinking water in, in South County to Mid County, probably up to about Fruitville Road, it's probably coming off of the Peace River. So I'm glad to be here today. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and next we have Dr. Mona Manja uh, of Bay Area Allergy and Asthma. Can you introduce yourself? And I'm yes, sorry if I'm... Terribly mispronounce your last name. It's okay. It's Mona Mongit, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I kind of feel like an odd man out up here, um, I, or odd woman out. I am uh, an internist and a pediatrician by training, and I practice allergy immunology in Pinellas County in a solo private practice. I am the recent, uh, I've recently stepped down as the board chair of Doctors for America, which is a national advocacy organization whose main goal is to help physicians to become advocates for their patients and for their communities. Um, and I have uh, my sort of connection to all this is in the medicine that I practice, I deal with a lot of respiratory illnesses and I see climate and its impact on my patients. And so I am here sort of to help frame this issue as a public health crisis in addition to all these um, other wonderful speakers. Thank, so thank you, you so much. Um, and finally, uh, Stevie Freeman Montez with the city of Sarasota. Can you tell us a little bit about you and, and your role at the city? Yes, hello. Is, is my mic on as well? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, my name is Stevie Freeman Montez. I work as the sustainability manager at the city of Sarasota. And how I kind of relate to this is for the first time the city of Sarasota um, began in 2016 a climate change vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan. So over the last year and a half, we've really been working hard as a, a city and as a staff um, across departments to understand climate science better and where we were vulnerable in our transportation and stormwater, wastewater, water, and um, kind of emergency operations sectors. And our commission uh, unanim unanimously adopted the plan back in January, and that was a big kind of professional milestone for me, but as a city as well. And um, so I kind of, I wouldn't say I'm a climate science expert by any means, but I've gained a lot of experience on our city infrastructure and where we're vulnerable. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, just to kind of set the scene for where we're at, I was curious to ask all of y'all, um, you know, sort of in your universe, what are the effects of climate change that you're already seeing? Sort of what are the things that you're seeing on the ground kind of in what you do um, that, you know, is related to climate change? Well, we've already had documented sea level rise and to the extent that, for example, north end of Sanibel Island, houses have gone into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, during the study I did on salt marshes, we were able to show with aerial photography between 1954 and today, the salt marshes have migrated inland where they've had the opportunity to about the length of a football field. And mangroves have moved into salt marshes where they previously occurred. In the middle of Pine Island Sound and Charlotte Harbor air system, there are things called donut islands where the black mangrove forests have been, had their nematophores overtopped by sea level rise and the forest has died. Um, quite f frankly, up and down the whole coast, there are signs of the sea level rise already occurring. And people talk about a thing that used to be a slang term from Australia, the king tide. The king tides are happening in many of our communities and on a regular and predictable basis. We've had uh, increased um, exotic species moving northward, as was earlier mentioned. We've had an increase in tropical diseases in all of our health departments report it. Um, we've had uh, longer dry seasons with longer drought and more compressed wet seasons where the rain falls more rapidly in a shorter period of time. And that's led to some of those extreme flooding events. For example, from Irma, we had record floods which exceeded any 100-year storm event than anyone had ever seen before. And we've had about a 1.2 degree Fahrenheit increase in the background temperature for our region in the last 100 years. And Kevin, I know you mentioned that sort of you, you think there has been some impact on water quality so far, but you, you kind of said that you, we don't necessarily have the data yet to capture that. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, uh, uh, I, I certainly want to add to what uh, all the all the points that uh, Jim brought up. Um, in, in 2013, well, give me, let me give you some background. Uh, our river intake is about 35 miles from the Gulf of Mexico, which sounds like a long way, but that river intake is at sea level. And so daily we see a tidal flux there of a foot and a half or so, depending on high and low tide. So during the dry season, when there's not very much flow in the Peace River, we can get brackish water conditions that would come back as far as our river intake. So uh, the data that we're talking about, in 2013, we uh, collaborated with the USGS to put a gauge station right at our river intake so that we would know what the salinity was every 15 minutes. So we have a great database we're starting to collect. But that is only about five years old now. If we had had that gauge station there 30 years ago, then I'm sure we'd be able to do the comparative analysis and see that the impact on salinity. So as sea level rises, our biggest concern, the Peace River doesn't have a dam in it. It doesn't have a salinity barrier. So in the wet season, there's so much fresh water coming out of Polk County and Hardy County and DeSoto County uh, that it pushes the saline interface way out into Charlotte Harbor. And that's going to continue. Uh, water's still going to flow downhill even if sea level rises. Uh, it's those windows of opportunity um, after the, the wet season that we're concerned about. And as, as sea level, as, as salinity makes its way back towards our river intake, those windows of opportunity to harvest water will become shorter. And so that's, that's our primary concern about uh, sea level rise. And Mona, what are you hearing from patients or seeing kind of with the groups you work with? Yeah, so um, in the fall of last year, Lancet uh, um, published a piece that clearly articulated that we are in the midst of a public health crisis and that climate change is the cause of that crisis. And so I see it in everyday practice. Um, we know that increasing ground level ozone causes respiratory distress in patients who have underlying lung disease. So I care for people with asthma and COPD and emphysema. And those patients do worse when ozone levels uh, are higher ground level. Um, when there is drought and forest fires and things like that, we have more particulate matter in the air, PM 2.5. It, it goes directly through our skin. It goes through our respiratory tract, it impacts lung health, it impacts cardiac health, um, impacts uh, the most vulnerable in our communities. 
Um, and then we see uh, disease related to heat. So when with rising temperatures, we have more of these extreme variations and we have heat strokes. We see these more often. We see the young, the elderly, and the infirm are the ones that cannot you know, moderate their temperatures the way they need to. And so heat related diseases are um, increasing in frequency. Um, and then you spoke about the infectious diseases because of changing climate and rising temperatures, we are finding vector borne diseases are becoming more, um, more frequent and they're appearing in areas where they weren't before. So now you see Lyme disease occurring much further south than it used to. You see malaria, you see dengue, you have chikungunya, you have all of these things that uh, those vectors, mosquitoes, these insects have a much more favorable breeding um, seasons because of temperatures. And then an issue very close to my heart, which is pollen, um, which is a funny thing to say. <laughs> but um, climate change is causing more pollen in our environments. We are having longer pollen seasons. And um, recent data shows that certain plants are releasing different kinds of pollen. They're calling it super pollen. And this is more allergenic pollen. It's bigger and it's stickier. And so it's causing a lot more disease, more exacerbations of asthma, more allergic you know, rhinitis and conjunctivitis and all that sort of, of thing. Um, and they believe that, that this photochemical smog is also preventing the release of this pollen from the environment that you would normally see, so higher levels in the, in the air that we breathe. So lots of health effects that we're seeing. Um, and, and you know, it's not just in, in specific places, we're seeing it everywhere. And Stevie, what have you seen at the city? Um, yeah, so, you know, of course the city provides these really critical public services, you know, from, from pumping our, you know, uh, water supply to wastewater treatment and roads and evacuation routes and all that kind of stuff. And so for, for us, we've been taking this first stab of understanding the infrastructure that we um, provide those public services um, within those public services. And we definitely are already making changes to how we build our lift stations and where the um, electrical equipment of those, what elevation they're at, where um, our barrier islands are, you know, um, definitely a vulnerable area. And when we, we went recently to tour um, Longboat on a King Tide day, just to understand um, what it really looks like visually to see that sunny day flooding up the stormwater and understand what they've been trying already, um, what type of infrastructure um, they've been trying on their stormwater outfalls. So, you know, in terms of there's some things we're already seeing that we're having to do differently with our infrastructure, and then there's a lot of things that we're, um, we're going to need to do in the, in the future once that infrastructure comes to the end of its lifespan. I mean, we make big decisions that last in investments that are 50 50-year lifespans, and so you know we're, we need to make the right um, choice based on the knowledge we have currently and what's and what's projected in the future. So, um, yeah, I mean, some of those th that's some examples of the current you know things we're looking at right now. Adding to uh -huh. the adding to the barrier island issue is the return rate of beach renourishment is getting shorter and shorter. So the number of years you have between a re renourishment event and having to renourish again has gotten less and it's measurable through time because of the sea level rise. In the last 100 years, um, generally in Southwest Coast, we've had between nine and 11 inches of sea level rise depending on which city you're at. And you kind of mentioned the projections. I mean, you know, I think in some of the notes that you sent along, I mean, you're sort of, there's everything from 12 inches to 198 inches of potential sea level rise. So Wait, wait, that was a typo. Oh, was it? Oh. I'm glad. That nine should have been there. Gotcha, okay. All right. About 12 to 18. That's good yeah. enough. Not 100. But even then, you know, so there is this range. So. As, as you're making kind of the, like these long-term plans, you know, how do you sort of suss out kind of what you should be planning for, you know, when there is a range? That is a great question. And that's something we've become more comfortable with over this year and a half because we got that question a lot of there's, there's these scenarios and everybody wants to choose one number and what is, going, what is it going to be in 2050, you know, and, and why is there that uncertainty? And I could talk about, you know, that for quite a while. But what we, what the approach we've taken is looking at the um, specific decision we have in front of us, um, let's say it's a, a lift station for our wastewater treatment plant, how long is it expected to last? And so that kind of makes us look at what area of the, the scenarios we consider. And then how critical is it if that, um, if that specific infrastructure is inundated by sea level rise or storm surge, you know, if it's out of commission, is that 
detrimental to the health of our community, then we should build it to the most, um, the highest scenario. If it's not, I don't want to say a major factor, but if it's not that detrimental to our community, we might be able to um, look at the lower end of the spectrums and make decisions based on the risk and vulnerability at each stage. So that's kind of how we've been going about it, is, is looking at um, the scenarios and the decision we're making in the lifespan of that project. Gotcha. Good. For the five communities I've worked with, um, Punta Gorda, which was the first city in the state of Florida to de develop and adopt an adaptation plan, I showed them what was going on at its current rate, what was the 50% probability of future increases with, if there was an acceleration in rate, and what was the 10% probability, which was a much worse case scenario. And they looked at all of that and the decision makers decided they'd plan for that mid-range for that 50% probability community-wide. That's Lake County has done the same thing. That's also been the case for the city of Cape Coral, which is the most recent one I've completed. And also within this Pelican Cove, they're, they're looking at that mid-range. So that's generally been what the decision makers have decided. In each case, they'd made that decision. So I, I use a inter, an iterative community <coughs> process with consensus. I do the planning with the community, but they made the decisions. And Kevin, what about yourself when you're looking at sort of planning long term? Well, uh, we have uh, collaborated with some scientists. Um, some of you may know uh, or may remember uh, Ralph Montgomery. Dr. Ralph Montgomery did a lot of work in Charlotte Harbor, and uh, he unfortunately uh, passed away far too soon a few years ago. Uh, but Tony Jenicki uh, worked with us as well to develop models to project the salinity interface and, and relationship to river flow as sea level rises. And so we have uh, develop some system models that look at uh, sea level rise from from very small scenarios such as uh, about one and a half inches up to uh, 24.6 inches which is uh, consistent with uh, some of the the, uh, the the revised numbers uh, <laughs> that we talked about there and so uh, that it's it's really uh, helpful for us because as as Stevie said our responsibility as public servants is to develop infrastructure that is sustainable and you don't build off-stream reservoirs that cost 90 million dollars um, if they're not going to still be a wise investment in 50 or 75 or 100 years so we're fairly confident uh, in our um, the, the regional water supply resiliency and sustainability through about two feet of sea level rise and and why that two feet becomes important uh, is because the Peace River, like most rivers, have sort of a braided estuary. And so that freshwater flood pushes that salinity interface downstream. But if sea level rise is too much, then now instead of the, 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 the salinity interface following the river channel, it is now spilling out of its banks and, and it is a sheet flow back towards us. And so we don't have models. We don't have the mathematical relationships to predict um, what we're going to see in those circumstances. But, but another element in regional uh, sustainability and reliability is interconnecting other sources. And so the, the Peace River Minnesota Regional Water Supply Authority has put into place about 80 large diameter, up to four feet in diameter water transmission mains throughout the four counties to interconnect other groundwater and surface water sources. And so that's a, a huge element of uh, resiliency and that gives us the ability not only in emergencies to transfer water and wheel water from sources but also it gives us the ability to do some seasonal rotation management. It makes sense to run uh, groundwater sources uh, during droughts and it makes sense to, to rest them in the wet season and that's, that's the uh, water supply management philosophy that we're headed towards. I want to talk some about um, you know, the effect we're going to see on the, the local economy. Um, Mona, I was wondering if you could talk some about how climate change is going to affect healthcare spending and sort of healthcare infrastructure. So we've already seen that um, climate change is impacting healthcare spending. It's causing an increase primarily as related to chronic diseases, asthma, COPD, cardiac diseases. Um, and, and the infrastructure that we currently have in place is inadequate to care for these patients. Um, and so it's straining a, a uh, healthcare system that is um, already operating on all cylinders and not able to keep up with um, the amount of patients that we have and the amount of illness in the United States. So, I mean, uh, we are already seeing these impacts. We were seeing them before climate change, but this is just another added stress to the situation. And you mentioned the, the disaster in Puerto Rico, I mean, had some unintended consequences or sort of unexpected consequences yeah. uh, that you saw. 
Yeah, it was. I, I think um, most recently Irma and uh, I think it was Maria both kind of brought to light some situations that I don't think that the healthcare profession had considered. Um, one was with Maria when we saw uh, nursing homes um, that were not able to mm. have electricity and so their patients died because of overheating. Um, and that's not something I don't think anyone had ever probably anticipated that that would be an issue. Um, so that's one. And then the second is uh, specifically in Puerto Rico, they are the major supplier for IV fluids and IV bags in the United States. And so we've had a major shortage because those companies in Puerto Rico haven't had electricity um, and they haven't been able to uh, keep up with the demand. So these are kind of, you know, isolated scenarios, but we'll, we will probably start to see more and more of these sorts of things that will highlight the inadequacies in our system right now. And Stevie, can you talk some about, I mean, you know, economically what climate change is going to mean for the city of Sarasota? Well, I mean, we when we went through the vulnerability assessment, we um, prioritized, we looked at over 220 assets and infrastructure the city owns, and then we prioritized them, and there were about 80 priority uh, vulnerabilities that we identified as ones we need to kind of take care sooner rather than later um, to, to inform our resiliency. And those projects are going to take money, you know, and so I think the economics of just the sheer economics and scale and where it's all going to come from, I think we all want to know all the answers now. And, uh, you know, we just don't know exactly how all of them are going to play out and where we're going to get the funding that needs to um, to happen from. So there's different solutions at different points in the in the line. But there's also, of course, um, tourism that plays into mm -hmm. things like uh, red tide and our beaches mm -hmm. and their vulnerability and erosion and what our short-term options are and our long-term options. Um, and the, the um, mortgage and insurance sectors, you know, all those play into um, tax base uh, issues um, in the long term. And so these are all things that we're kind of um, you know, taking into, starting to think about um, on our end uh, at the moment. But adaptation also has some financial benefits mm -hmm. as well as cost. When the city of Punta Gorda put together a functional adaptation plan, they were able to change their insurance rating for the whole community. So the citizens there in the city itself don't have to pay as much for insurance because they've got plans to deal with things like sea level rise. In the Lee County plan, they had greenhouse gas reduction aspects to their adaptation plan. They've implemented them with solar, energy efficiency, a lot of the things we were talking about in the presentation before our break. And these have saved millions of dollars for the local government. Uh, similarly for um, some of the other communities that are doing this, City of Cape Carl as well. So as you do your adaptations that might help with mitigation or show people you know what you're doing with regard to flooding, you can reduce costs for your community. That's true. I was, I was just going to mention in there, there's uh, definitely the lenders and bond ratings for cities are better if you show that you're planning for resiliency. And so that also plays into it as that's a good movement forward, too. Kevin, how's it going to affect, I mean, the cost of water? Well, uh, we're, we're fortunate in this part of the world um, uh, in that we enjoy fairly low uh, water rates. The average, I live in Manatee County, I live in Parrish. Um, the average uh, 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 house, household of four in uh, Manatee County pays about 90 to $100 a month for water and sewer. And our, the median household income in Manatee County is $47,000 a year. So when you divide uh, the uh, $1,200 a year for water and sewer, divide by the median household income, it's about 2.5% of median household income. The EPA has a general guideline. They, they like to see, um, as far as communities go, they, afford, they have an affordability index. And as long as the combined cost of water and sewer is below 4.5%, they consider it in, in line. So, so uh, our water rates uh, and wastewater rates are, are fairly uh, good compared to other parts of the country. But there are parts of the, of the country that are really struggling. Uh, Detroit, uh, city of Philadelphia, New York City, um, uh, facing tremendous uh, increases in their water and wastewater rates. Um, City of Philadelphia, I read this just the other day, they have over $200 million worth of uncollected water revenue. People haven't paid their bills. Uh, 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 Philadelphia, Detroit, they have cut off over uh, 10,000 uh, water accounts. The city, uh, New York City does not cut off water accounts. So I'm, 
Um, I'm not sure exactly how they expect to collect the revenue if you're delinquent and you know they're not going to cut you off. <laughs> um, Manatee County, uh, just, just so you understand, the people that work in government are also compassionate. And so I talked to some of the folks in customer service uh, with uh, utilities in Manatee County. And I said, what do you do for uh, a family that is... Um, uh, maybe they're below the poverty line and they're just not able to make their uh, water bill. Do you, do you cut them off? And they said, well, you know, we, we understand we're, you know, there's a humanistic side to this as well. The United Way can help. Uh, there's a number of uh, church organizations that can also help. And, and uh, the woman I spoke to uh, very, very kindly for a few minutes, she's told me that, you know, if they'll just offer to pay a few dollars, uh, a month, you know, we'll work out some sort of a deal. So I think, you know, from a policy standpoint, uh, City of Philadelphia is uh, the a leader in the in the country in this, and that they're they're working out a water rate that is based upon your ability to pay, and they're the first. Uh, of course, they're they're facing two hundred million dollars worth of uncollected revenue, uh, so it's they're kind of a guinea pig in this. Um, it's interesting, you know, if you're if you're a household of four and uh, you're, you know, it doesn't matter whether you live in a gated community or a very poor side of town, you pay the same amount for water if you use the same amount of water, and so uh, we have met, we have Medicaid for uh, to help with health care costs that people can't make. We have other forms of government assistance uh, if you're if you're struggling, but everybody pays the same water rate, and so as we have to implement some of these uh, more costly changes, adaptation management strategies, the cost of water rates are going to increase. And uh, uh, there may be some consideration that needs to be given to how will we bring those at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum along. Go. Yeah, go. South, south of here, many communities are already on desalinization, particularly barrier islands, places like the Florida Keys, and even communities which are drawing water from deep wells in the interior, that water is becoming um, salinated through saltwater intrusion, and they're having to desalinate that before it goes to public use. That's a very expensive process. And they're expecting it's going to be more and more difficult as salinization of aquifers increases, and the drawdowns of those aquifers is very pronounced. In contrast, agriculture water is relatively free. And the water management district, the South Florida Water Management District, gives priority to them getting the potable borders that are on the surface, while the communities of the citizens have to fund these technological solutions. Ultimately, we are going to have a major water crisis at the southern end of the peninsula, because particularly the folks that I work with on the east southeast coast, the sea levels are not just going to rise on the coast, the water levels of salinity are going to rise in the interior through the karst system. And they are not going to have a water supply, a local water supply of fresh water. Um, they're going to have to import it in some way or else desalinate it all. Mona, can you talk some about the, what are the populations that you see most at risk, I mean, for some of these health crises that you're mentioning? Yeah, um, as I was mentioning, you know, we typically see these uh, health impacts in the most vulnerable populations. So our youngest patients, our oldest patients, and those with chronic diseases. Um, and there is a clear um, socio socioeconomic impact uh, that's seen um, more in lower socioeconomic statuses. Um, these patients usually have limited uh, access to health care. Uh, so that's the first problem that, you know, it, even without uh, climate change, that would be an issue. Um, they also tend to have limited resources to battle some of the uh, the climate changes. So when there are these heat waves that we've been seeing that are um, taking us to, you know, weeks and weeks of very high temperatures, they may not have the ability or they don't have air conditioning in their apartments or they don't have, you know, f functioning air conditioners. Um, so that's an issue. They are also, um, these communities are also most impacted uh, by water quality. Um, at, we've seen what happened in Flint, um, Michigan, and these sorts of situations. Um, and so, it, you know, there is a disparate impact on those who are the most vulnerable in our communities. And that's, it, it seems like every catastrophe seems to, to uh, impact those who have the least means and the least uh, ability to um, come out of these uh, catastrophes. And can you tell us some, I mean, you mentioned also the, the relationship between kind of rising temperatures and also mental health crises. Okay. Can you talk some about mental health? Yeah, so you know, I'm not a mental health provider, but I was interested as I was doing some research uh, before coming to this panel that you do see um, with prolonged heat um, 
events, you do see increase in certain types of crime, and you do see increases in mental health, um, uh, destabilization of patients who have chronic mental health um, problems. And if we talk about um, our current infrastructure for treating mental health, it is you know horrible. We don't have enough providers who provide mental health. We don't have enough um, insurance coverage for patients with these diseases, so they're usually under-treated or poorly treated. So this is, you know, this is sort of a, um, the perfect storm. Um, you don't have the access to the care you need, and you don't have the ability to handle the heat, and then you have an underlying mental illness. So um, it, it's, it's very interesting, all the different impacts that, that occur just from heat. And Stevie, when you look at the city, I mean, are there particular populations in the city that are most vulnerable? I, I would say the, the similar, um, similar to what, um, what she was just saying that we, um, you know, I completely agree. Those that um, have been kind of historically under, underserved as well and that are already, they're starting the race from a mile behind, mm -hmm. you know, so any of those impacts um, that, that come, that it's just a different, it can be a different starting point for some populations. And so how we, how we address uh, resiliency um, within, within those communities is really important, I think has to stay forefront of the conversation. I want to talk some about you know what we're doing to prepare for it, or how prepared we think we are. Jim, kind of how would you rate where we're how we're doing it as far as preparing or planning for this? Well, it's variable depending on the communities. <laughs> some of our communities are preparing very well, and uh, for example, in Punta Gorda, which was uh, got started in 2009, they've implemented the majority of their uh, adaptations and showing progress, measurable progress, because in their plan, no long, not only did they say what they were going to do, they talked about how they were going to measure, they were getting to success, who was going to do the measuring and have a regular reporting of that. Um, but other communities on um, Southwest Florida are not even wanting to talk about this, um, <laughs> principally because of, um, and I'm going to be frank, it became a one political party area and a certain branch of that political party which denies that this even exists. And they've become, the, the, and it's been changed. Previously we had decision makers who want to talk about this. Now we have decision makers who don't even want to have planning, let alone climate change planning. So it's a, a very irregular topography of uh, being prepared. Generally, it's been the municipalities and the citizens mm -hmm. who have done the planning more than the counties, although um, Lee County is an exception there. And Kevin, what about the, the water supply? How, how do you feel like you guys are prepared? Well, I would say uh, um, we're in pretty good shape from a water supply perspective, um, although with a thousand people a day moving to Florida, uh, some of them are going to come to our area. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're going to have to develop 20 to 30 million gallons a day of additional water supply uh, over the next 30 years. And where that water supply is going to come from uh, is going to be really important to us. And uh, one of the things that we can't uh, lose sight of is, is reclaimed water and reuse. It's a, it's a, a valuable uh, resource. And we do a good job of irrigating golf courses with it, and we do a good job of uh, irrigating medians with it. And in some communities, they have that option for irrigating their yards. Uh, but there are parts of the uh, nation where they use that as their source of drinking water. Uh, and so direct potable reuse is something that we're going to hear more of. As 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 we um, uh, as we as we see more and more people moving into water scarce areas, there are communities in Texas and Oklahoma right now where that is their source of water supply. After going through a four and a five year drought, they pulled the trigger on that very expensive uh, treatment uh, technology. And as Jim said, desalinization, desalination uh, is always out there. Uh, it is a certain cost. Um, the uh, direct potable uh, reuse can be done for less, but there is a certainly a public uh, perception barrier that has to be overcome. Uh, so uh, the Tampa Bay area in their master plan they are currently looking at and, and uh, planning organizations do master plans that are frequency of, of every five years generally. So the Tampa Bay Water Organization which is our uh, um, compatible organization to the north of us are looking at direct potable and indirect potable reuse as options for, for them. Uh, for the future. Uh, we are just starting our master planning process and anticipate that uh, we don't have the scope nailed down just yet, but we anticipate that, that somewhere in that master plan we will consider those um, uh, alternatives as well because they are 
part of the future. The cheap water is gone. The groundwater is gone. It's already overutilized. And as Jim said, we have saltwater intrusion problems now due to overpumping. Uh, so it's really incumbent upon us to be thinking about all of the uh, options and keeping them all on the table. Mona, are departments of health and uh, physicians organizations, are they sort of thinking about this and planning for this? Yeah, I think the conversation is starting, but I do agree it's a very, um, uh, it, there's a great degree of variability. Um, in the city where I live in St. Petersburg, I think we are lucky to have a very forward thinking um, mayor and deputy mayor who are very focused on health. Um, and so I think that is a, um, a plus for our community. Uh, in terms of emergency preparedness, I think um, the recent IRMA kind of showed that things were in place, uh, all the pieces were in place. Um, sheltering of people, especially sick people during those events seemed to occur quite, uh, quite well. There is quite a, um, a push to make sure and ensure that during heat waves, uh, our homeless population is housed in a way that um, allows for them to remain cool. Um, but I think if you if you look at this from a national perspective or from a state perspective, it's quite dismal. Um, primarily, when I speak about access to healthcare, because um, you know, from a, a um, uh, a national standpoint, trying to uh, pull back some of the improvements that were found with health care reform uh, has been a problem, and it has led to less access to care. And in our state, um, our governor has continued to refuse to expand Medicaid, and so we still have these populations of people that are just kind of stuck, and there's nothing they can do to access the care, and yet they continue to be sick, and it, you know, it doesn't make a difference if you have insurance or not, you're still going to get sick. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, work to be done on a national and state level, but I see a lot of hope in these uh, small communities and um, you know, municipalities. And Stevie, how do you rate the city's efforts? Kind of where are we at? Um, you know, I'm really torn because I think we're a lot better than we were two years ago. You know, we know we know where we're vulnerable uh, within our city infrastructure and our public services, and we have general ideas of what we need to do about that. Um, but we need to implement more. We need to also um, do better around the community scale, community wide. Um, vulnerabilities and adaptation and how we can um, facilitate that dialogue more. But where I think we're, we're really doing well in Sarasota right now is the community dialogue. Um, there's a recent new group, the Climate Council of Sarasota Manatee, that's really trying to bring cross-sector uh, different um, organizations together to communicate and educate in the same way um, about climate change impacts locally and to work on joint adaptation kind of solutions. So I think those types of dialogue have really, um, I've noticed, I, I've only been here the last three years, so I can't speak to, um, speak to too further along, but I feel like there's a lot of culture, um, you know, uh, change that is happening uh, recently and a lot more, a lot of dialogue around it. So in, in some ways, I think we're really prepared um, or we're, you know, pretty far along because we, we've identified our vulnerabilities, but I completely recognize we have, you know, a lot more to do. <laughs> Jim, you mentioned sort of the importance of community involvement and in sort of developing these plans. Um, you know, how do you achieve that? How do you actually accomplish that? Well, we actually go out to the public in the community and have public meetings with them and discuss with them the general issues of what do they see are the vulnerabilities of their community. So rather than acting like an expert from some higher institution, we go to them and ask them what do they see is happening? How do they perceive the changes where they are? And we take from them through a process of interactive public participation games, which were originally developed for transportation planning um, by my wife, Dr. Lisa Beaver. Um, and we use them to tell us what they see. And then we help categorize and organize that for them into things that seem very recognizable to y'all. Like they see the sea level rise, they see the loss of habitat, they see the infrastructure weaknesses, they see the increasing temperatures. And I let the community tell me what, what their vulnerabilities are. One of the interesting things about that is normally in these communities, I'll have people who start out very negative about climate change planning, but as they participate with other community members, they begin to come along with the idea that yes, changes are happening, as long as we don't get into a too big debate about who's causing the changes or what's causing the changes. And so they're willing to adapt to make their community strong and come up with ideas. And then after we have those vulnerabilities de developed, 
we come bring back to them different options they might have available to address the specific vulnerabilities they identified. Then they select for another process of games, and we actually make a game board of their jurisdictional area, of their city or their county, and then they identify which adaptations they are willing to do where, and they actually pin it onto the board of the location, or if it's community or citywide. And something we have done, and we were the first to do this, as far as I could tell in the world, we asked them what they were not willing to do. So we didn't ex try to explore adaptations that the community was not willing to try at all. And so this crafts a adaptation plan to their identified vulnerabilities, which is specific to that community, and by the time we bring it to the decision makers at the end of the process, they know that everyone in their communities had a chance at it, from the realtors to the environmentalists, the police department, the fire department, the community development, the health department, everybody's had participation in this, the seasonal visitor, the long-term resident, the minority communities of all the different types that might be there. And then the decision makers say, well, this is our plan. We developed the plan. And then they unanimously adopt it and they're ready, ready to implement it. And so this is the thing. If you get people to do the planning with you, then they are willing to implement the adaptations which they've selected. Great, I'm sure we've got some great questions from the audience. Maybe if we could pull up on the, the screen up here, anything that anybody is plugged in or is asking? Oh, we're supposed uh, to see this. Or actually, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Bless your phone. <laughs> um, so uh, we got some questions. We're gonna do kind of one of the word cloud things that you guys might have seen uh, earlier this morning or yesterday. So climate change is one word. You've gotta come up with one word for what that is. So pull out your phone and put in the code. <laughs> <laughs> Happening. Serious. <laughs> Scary, optional, oh, devastating, yeah. challenging, here, now, fixable, and the <laughs> real. Great. Can we uh, go on to the next question? So what worries you most about the local impact from climate change? Um, so we've got sea level rise, more powerful storms, ocean acidification, danger to human health, and wildlife extinction and displacement. <coughs> sea level rise, probably not too much of a surprise in Sarasota. And storms, of course, too. And I think we got one more question. So sea level rise was the top. What steps have you taken in your personal life to combat or prepare for climate change? Talk about some things that maybe you've modified your behavior or things that you've gotten involved with um, as a result of climate change. Gone solar, drive less, moved inland, solar again, childless, interesting, became a vegetarian. <clears throat> uh, limit carbon footprint, LED lighting, eat less meat, use less water plant native, uh, carbon offsets, composting, not buying a house on the water. <laughs> <laughs> Bought a house on high land, that's a popular one. <clears throat> uh, insulation and rain barrels, um, storm shutters, mitigation, energy efficiency, no meat. I'm seeing really vegetarianism really and no meat a lot. Yeah, I love that. Um, Talk. Talking. <laughs> uh, an electric car, plant a native garden, gotcha. And is there a way to pop up questions from the audience on here as well? Or we can just raise hands, whatever. It's up there, gotcha, okay. Questions? I'm sure you've got some good ones. We've got about five minutes, so uh, if you guys have some, some questions around this off, that'd be fantastic. Uh, tell me something hopeful. So each, <laughs> what are you optimistic about uh, as you address climate change? For I, anybody? <laughs> I'll jump in. Yeah. I think we should go back to Lee Hayes' drawdown yeah. um, presentation, because yeah. yeah, I left there feeling like, wow, there's 
the concrete things we yeah. can do, and some of them were so relatable and can be done now. And so I think the next steps, personally, doing um, doing more of those items, and also I hope you um, leave this conversation with we are doing things. There's a lot happening around this. A lot of people preparing. And um, you know, there's levels within us as individuals, as organizations, you know, um, that need to be worked on. But there's a lot of people working on the issue, so I hope that comes across. Yeah, Jim. 84%. Well, when we do our climate change planning, we do a pre-survey before we even start the meetings for background knowledge. And 84% of the people in our region, including everyone's political persuasion, uh, want to adapt to. Um, be prepared for climate change in Southwest Florida. It's much higher than the national averages you see in the media. Yeah. Um, one question is, how can community members um, help increase community involvement and engagement? So um, when you guys are, are looking at these things, how can we yeah, be effective in how we speak up? Encourage, yeah. encourage your decision makers to do a climate change adaptation plan for your community, whether they be federal, state, county commission, city council, even your own community. Individual, private communities can do a climate change plan. I am challenging Babcock Ranch to put together a climate change adaptation plan um, with their community. Um, everyone should be thinking about doing it, and that way they can make the right decisions rather than have to unmake the wrong ones they, they did. I, I, would, I would encourage uh, organizations to develop decision tools that factor in uh, climate variability. Uh, the, the system models that I talked about, we have the ability in those system models to, to uh, parametrically change uh, uh, rainfall and runoff values uh, for the full 12 months of the year. So we can play those what if games. What if the dry season lasts two months longer? What if, we, if uh, evaporation rates increase 20% and precipitation rates uh, drop 20%? What is the combined impact of that? So I think those decision tools we can use to sort of inform our planning are very important. And Stevie, there's one I think this must be for you. So it's plans in Sarasota focused on sea level rise versus other kind of issues that come up with climate change. You know, sort of sea level rise obviously might be the most kind of threatening that people see, but uh, you know, what are the other things that you guys are working on? Oh yeah, I know we did focus a lot on the conversation of sea level rise, but we looked at four climate um, impacts. We looked at sea level rise, storm surge, which really we just considered um, in the future in addition to sea level rise. We also looked at ex uh, projections for extreme rainfall events and precipitation and air temperature heat days. So those were the four that are included in the city of Sarasota um, plan we did. And one question, I'm not sure, um, but the red tide, sort of what's the relationship between climate change and red tide and sort of are we going to see effects from that? Yeah, you're already seeing effects from that. And in fact, all harmful algae blooms are going to be enhanced and extended by the climate changes which are occurring. The combination of increased water temperature, the changes in precipitation which provide runoff of nutrients, um, changes that are occurring within the Gulf of Mexico, and even the, the gradual ocean acidification are going to all enhance that. And the, we're actually, we're now kind of at the point, some of us, although others disagree with us, we can pretty much know when to expect these red tides to occur based on the preceding weather conditions mm -hmm. which, which have happened. Mm -hmm. And um, they're going to be continuing. They're going to be more extreme. And um, you're going to see them in times of the year you didn't expect to see them as, as they occurred in the past. And we have been seeing a lot of health effects from red tide. Every year we see this exacerbations in asthma, COPD. We say eye irritation, nasal irritation, throat irritation, skin rashes, all of these things occurring just not even if you're in the water, just at the beach near the, the toxins being released by the algae blooms. Um, well, we are out of time. But Jim, Kevin, Mona, and Stevie, thank you all so much for, for being here. Thank you.